Good, uh, good evening. This is our second session in the course on uh, White House communications. That is uh, a, uh, a, I'd say, a two-state process, except we're uh, we're stateless here, uh, from Washington D.C. from uh, to uh, Towson University in uh, Towson, Maryland. And uh, the idea of this course is to give people an idea of what the relationship is between the White House and the press from the viewpoint of those who are part of the relationship. We are going to have uh, White House officials here. Dan Bartlett is going to come and Scott McClellan and Mike Curry will um, uh, will be guests in uh, three different weeks. And uh, then we have a, uh, last week we had William Seal, White House historian, who um, provided the setting for us of, uh, of the White House as a building and the ways in which it had been used to publicize the presidents and, uh, and their programs. Tonight, we have two pioneers. Um, Francis Lewin and Helen Thomas are uh, two reporters who have been important in uh, Washington uh, for, the, uh, for the work they have done and also for the uh, path that they blazed uh, for women. Um, I remember Helen when I uh, first uh, met you in 1975 when uh, I came into the White House working on portraying the president when uh, Mike and I came in. And, uh, and Helen welcomed every woman who came in as a reporter or me as a scholar and made sure that, um, that we were helped. And uh, because women at that time and way before had not been, and uh, Fran and, and Helen had made sure that they got access to uh, the corridors of power. Well, you did, Helen. <laughs> I mean, look at all the battles the two of you waged. <laughs> we chained ourselves to the White House fence and went to jail. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> well, you uh, were you, real pioneers. <laughs> well, you certainly do. You took on the uh, Correspondents uh, Association. The uh, National Press Club, the Gridiron, <laughs> was a pretty uh, good group between, uh, between the two. That's going to be the next fight, but they capitulated. They came first. Huh? Um, it, they worked um, for uh, competing wire services. They've been friends, but uh, worked for competing wire services. Helen worked for United Press International, and um, uh, until uh, recently, what year was it? Is it uh, when you went to hers? Is it '99? Uh, when you went to Hearst Newspapers? 2000. 2000. And um, uh, Fran uh, worked for Associated Press um, and went to uh, CNN in 1981. You were there at the beginning. <laughs> and in the first year. Uh -huh. And uh, she created CNN. Uh -huh. <laughs> in the good old days. In a good, in a good place for women. <laughs> So a, a good uh, a good place to, to begin is uh, uh, is what was reporting from the White House like when uh, when you came to Washington, even though um, you, when you started you were not White House correspondents, but uh, what was the atmosphere? Uh, what was the atmosphere in Washington uh, of reporters and their relationships with officials? And uh, what about at the White House? Ellen, why don't you start? Oh, you came, when when you I came. went to the White House? <coughs> Let's say when, when you came to Washington. When I came to Washington, it was World War II. I had never seen our country more unified. Everyone was in it together, except everyone believed in the war and so forth. And the whole town was rallied in one spirit, and had, they had moved from the Great Depression. So great people had come to this country, to, to this town, from all over the country social workers, teachers, healthcare, everyone, all wanting to pitch in and bring the country back, and then we went into World War II. But um, I think we never had any sense of dissent, as we later saw in Vietnam. As for the uh, press, there was a very small group of men, mostly men, but some women who did come to press conferences. And of all things, Franklin D. Roosevelt held two news conferences a week in the Oval Office. And of course, he was in total command and couldn't quote him directly. And if he didn't like the question, he'd tell you to go stand in the corner or put a dunce cap on. So it was you were kind of taking a chance to ask a question that was a little off the uh, parameters. But uh, it was a town that uh, I think all of you would have liked it then. It was not divisive, and everyone was pulling together. 
and has a real sense of unity. Uh -huh. And you have to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt, who was responsible really for getting a, a lot of women journalists their first jobs because she held press conferences closed to men and only women could cover her. So every organization had to hire a woman reporter to cover Mrs. Roosevelt. She made news. Yes, she did. And uh, that was a breakthrough for a lot of women who uh, the organizations couldn't cover Mrs. Roosevelt without a woman. And so mm -hmm. that, that led the way in a sense to. The whole moose was to get these people to hire women uh -huh. reporting. Uh -huh. Uh, what was re reporting on the First Lady uh, like? What's that, what sort of subjects? Um, say, compare uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and, and Bestrom and, and Mamie Eisenhower. Well, because I, you all covered, I guess, between you two, you covered. Well, really, I didn't start covering until Mamie Eisenhower, but we all knew about Mrs. Roosevelt, and she mm -hmm. traveled all over and took women with her. Bess Furman, who worked for the Associated Press and then for the New York Times wrote, wrote books about uh, her travels and she made news everywhere. And so that was a big uh, uh, boost for women in that uh, direction. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, Bess Truman uh, did not do very much. I mean, she was not, she was stayed out of that kind of role. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and Mrs. Roosevelt was really a controversial person. Of course, she was so dynamic and uh, she was butting in everywhere to, as a real do-gooder, mm -hmm. and she was slammed all over the place, and there was a cartoon showing her going down the coal mine, mm -hmm. and one mine was saying to the other, here comes Eleanor. <laughs> you can also see her in the crossfire in, at, at, in battle, on battlefields and so uh -huh. forth. She walked in where angels feared the dead. <laughs> um, oh, she also took a look where you live now, at Georgetown. Uh -huh. And it was all black by that time. And she said, isn't this lovely? Isn't it quaint? And the whites started moving in and buying up the property. She transformed it, uh -huh. maybe for the better. Maybe, <laughs> I'm not sure. I always uh, was had a, a later incident with her. I was trying to get copies of, uh, see if there were any transcripts of the press conferences that she had to get an idea of what was going on. And nobody seemed to have them anywhere. So one day I ran into Mrs. Roosevelt and I said to her, do you know, does anybody have any transcripts of your press conference? And she said, now who would want that? <laughs> My day. <Yeah. laughs> no, it was a different atmosphere. But of course, I mean, the whole question of journalism, press corps and so forth has just grown monumentally. Mm -hmm. What was uh, when was the first time you walked into the uh, West Wing of the White House into the press room there, and what was it like? We saw last it was, time. Uh, kind of on it inauguration was. day, January 20, 1961. I moved in with Kennedy, and I never left. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was one room. What it now would be the National Security Affairs Office. It was. I don't yeah. know what it's you, when you go it in when you small. go in the uh, the West Wing, right? Uh, the, the newspapers the, all around. Right. To the right. Well, this this is you have to say something else. It was very different because when you walked in, there was an entrance lobby with a huge table that had come from some former president, and a couple of couches around. That was the entrance to the president's oh, yeah. office. So guests came right past there, and the press could sit out in a on a couch and watch who's coming in and out of the president's office. Then to the side, we had our press room, mm -hmm. which was maybe half this size, mm -hmm. just about that big. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a it little It looked blue. like a men's club with leather furniture, spittoons, and <laughs> places to sleep. <laughs> and we had Don't a little telephone. telephone. We had actual telephone booths to where we went in to uh, right. phone in our stories. Were the phone booths in the press room itself? Yeah. How many people would um, would be there on a, on a normal day? How many people would be uh, sitting around the couches and following the um, president's Not activity? Really. It depends on when the briefing, maybe I would say 15 or mm -hmm. 20. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. So, and how many women? <laughs> Us. <laughs> <laughs> so full time, we were there all the time. We were the gold dust twins. <laughs> um, Women would come for the briefings and so forth, but mm -hmm. we were the wires, and we stayed there eight days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, what, um, what were the rhythms of the day at the White House then? Uh, today, for example, uh, well, let's say not this very day, but uh, uh, on an ordinary day, the press secretary has um, an open meeting in the morning, the gaggle, he has a briefing that's televised in the afternoon, say at 12.30 or so, and then there are the other briefings that are coordinated with it from state and defense, and the president is going to appear usually in a speech um, at least once during that day, maybe twice, and a fundraiser at night. What were the, the rhythms at that time of the uh, White House? What did the president do? When you, were, uh, when you were covering him, how many things would you expect the president to be doing during a day? Many things. I mean, I thought that the Kennedy era was a golden era. It was greatly inspired. Uh, we could walk side by side with him. Uh, when he came out, there was no uh, gaggle of, of uh, Secret Service protecting him. We had incredible access. Mm -hmm. And he would make many appearances a day. The news was not that programmed as that one appearance a day, which later on they wanted the president to only show up once a day and so forth. It was very much more freewheeling. Kennedy would come through uh, through the reception room where we'd be hanging out. And, uh, we'd see his visitors to the door. We would throw questions at him. It was very uh -huh. different in the sense of access. And the press secretary had a little office where everybody could walk in or out. There was free access. And he would have a, just a press session with everybody standing around his desk and just shooting questions yeah, at him. Now there was no true. television and nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So it was very much more informal. And mm -hmm. then we had a lot of access. Paul Beach, usually in the wintertime, then uh, Pierre was ordered not to wear shorts anymore. <laughs> Ten <laughs> <Is that> television? <laughs> yeah, by that time, they got it. We used to travel a lot because he went down to their place at uh, both at Hyannisport in the in the summertime and Florida in the winter time. So we had a lot of traveling press operations, which was interesting, and uh, we all moved from one place to the other and just lived there when they were there for their periods of time. Both of you followed um, Mrs. Kennedy and, um, and tried to and, and, and reported she, her as she well. Hated yes. us. Yes. She, she, she hated us. She hated us. Well, I, I traveled with her to in, uh, in the Mediterranean where the press, a small group of press hired a 54-foot ocean-going yacht to follow this big uh, yacht that she was loaned by one of the Greek magnates there and we had to follow her from, from island to island and the very first night out there was a big electrical storm and, and our guy said I'm really sorry we're going to have to pull into a port we can't ride this storm out so he said oh boy we're lost we, we're out of this and so we pulled into this place and the next morning the sun was shining brightly and the greatest sight was her yacht parked next to us <laughs> <laughs> tell them about India Oh, well. <laughs> the worst part of all of this was that Jackie never said anything. And we traveled all through the Greek islands, and what we did was a travelogue. And we'd listen in. They would report back to what she was doing on the ship to shore radio. So we tuned in to the radio. We got this stuff so we could report it. Well, they found out what we were doing, so then they would go into French, Italian. But we had guys who spoke these languages and we'd say, hey Joe, it's French. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, got in on all this stuff. But it was mostly a travelogue and, and battles too. She went skiing one, one day off a, a beach and they had the Greek Navy chase everybody off the beach. And so our photographer got arrested and we went there to get him out of jail and they said to the captain of port, what does your queen do when she wants to go skiing? He says she goes to a private place. <laughs> Jackie was going to ski at this place, hoping everybody just get everybody out of there. So we had a lot of fun with that. India. India. Oh. <laughs> Did both of you go to India? No. Um, I went to India. She went to India and Pakistan, and uh, the whole time she never said anything. And the biggest thing we got was Jackie made a, a mystique to get a crowd. And, uh, <laughs> and so we were, we were, once again, we're writing travelogues, where she is, what she was wearing was the big thing. 
we, we knew we were going to have trouble, so we asked the press secretary before we went, could you please tell us who the designers are, what the clothes are like, because we always get the colors wrong and everything wrong, so we would like to be really right on this. So mistakenly, he gave us all this information in advance. So therefore, <laughs> most of what we wrote was about what Jackie was wearing. Uh, they were very upset about that. Uh, I remember a, a colleague of mine was very impressed because we were going to go to the Khyber Pass, and that was so dramatic. He always wanted to go there. So we went to the Khyber Pass, and the two big stories were, one, Jackie wore wraparound sunglasses, <laughs> which were the newest thing, and the other was one of the uh, cameramen put one foot over the border into Afghanistan, and they were going to grab him and <laughs> take him away. <laughs> Oh, then there was, <laughs> he's giving me all these incidents. Jackie, Jackie was going to come in India. They, they decorate the elephants magnificently. They paint them with chalk and all this, and they look wonderful. There was going to be this big parade of elephants in a courtyard for her. So we got there early, and uh, the, some of the uh, guys said, would you like to ride on an elephant? So we said, sure. So we got up on the elephants, and they're parading around. All of a sudden, Jackie arrives. And we're up on the elephants, <laughs> trying to get down. I'm going to cover Jackie. <laughs> so Theo Wilson. Never it. fear, she would say nothing. The New York Daily News was there. She said, don't worry, Jackie never says anything. So, you know, that was true. <laughs> so we were saved, but there wasn't No, she did not like us at all. We were called the Harpies. And uh, she. Tell them about what you did in, in, huh? in uh, Palm Beach. <laughs> Oh, we were uh, we were on the steps of the church when she was going in, and she alerted the Secret Service. Two Spanish-looking women. <laughs> you ought to arrest them. <laughs> what did the president think about your reporting? Did he did he complain? Uh, <laughs> as, he, uh, as she did. It's very, they were very ambivalent. Uh, they loved the pictures of photographs of the children, but at the same time, they wanted to put up a big facade that they hated the coverage of their children. Uh -huh. But every time there was a photograph, they asked for 10 copies. Because yeah. <laughs> I see here that uh, Kennedy signed a, a picture to you, and it says, with admiration and uh, in warm regards. Well, well tell them the story <laughs> about the hospital when John uh, Jr. was born. What? When, did you, when you were outside the <laughs> Oh, yeah. I had, uh, when Jackie, when John John was born, we all got phone calls at 11.30 at night, and everybody rushed to Georgetown Hospital, every reporter in town probably, and I'm putting up my hair and pulling it down and buttoning up and trying to grab a cab. We got there, and so Fran and I were at the hospital. We practically became nurses. We were there 10 days, and buttonholing Kennedy, who would come twice a day. And we'd think, what will we ask him next? And I remember asking him, uh, do you want your son to grow up to be president? And he said, I just want him to be healthy. Well, one day, on the 10th day, my boss told me to go to the Georgetown house instead of going to the uh, George, uh, Georgetown hospital because Kennedy was going to leave to do the protocol pro forma trip to the White House to meet with the sitting president who would tell him how to be president and tell him all the secrets. Well, I don't think he did. But anyway, Kennedy came out of the, his house on N Street, took one look at me and said, you've deserted my child. He had been on duty at the, at the hospital for 10 days. <laughs> it, it's very interesting because we really had sort of a very personal relationship with the president in those days. I mean, you could walk up to him and would, he would answer a question for you. And they knew us, and they weren't worried about us. We didn't have this uh, overkill Secret Service uh, entourage everywhere he went, and so we had we had, were much more able to understand what the president was like in those days. And there wasn't a huge amount of people going. There was always a press pool of just several people, and mostly UP and AP. And so we got a chance to uh, be very able to understand and get close to. What was going on? What kinds of things could you would you ask him? Would you ask him about a particular policy that he uh, decision that might be uh, underway? Sure. Anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, was it all on no. the record? Okay. Was it on the record? Would yeah. he speak um, yeah. on back yeah. off the record? No. Or all on the record? Yeah. I I once got him out of a 
a bad situation at a news conference, and I was supposed to end the news conference, and he got a, a question that was very clear. He didn't know the answer. He kept talking, hoping to hit on the answer. And I finally got up and said, thank you, Mr. President. He said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And then once uh, a Latin American president, Venezuela, I think, came to the White House, and Fran and I had been protesting, saying that he should not go to the National Press Club where we couldn't go. We tell the, but the Venezuelan president did plan to go, and Kennedy saw him to the door, and he pointed to me and he said, there is one of the revolutionaries. <laughs> and so I said to the, the president of Venezuela, well, we forgive you officially. And Kennedy said, but not personally. <laughs> well, I have to tell you about that at this time in the Kennedy period. I think there were about 66 women who were actually accredited to cover the White House and among hundreds of uh, men. And they had an annual White House correspondence dinner in honor of the president. No women allowed. So we were pretty upset about that. But we could be members of the association yeah. and the dues were $2 a year. And the only raison d'etre, the only reason to have the association was to give a dinner in honor of the President of the United States once a year. We were members and we were not allowed to go to the dinner. So we started a campaign with Salinger and Kennedy and all of them and, and the end result was after uh, crying and yelling and whatever, uh, we finally, Kennedy just said, I won't go unless women can go. And that was the end of that and to this very day, women can go to that. That was one of the easiest breakthroughs uh -huh. when the president actually understood the problem and helped us out. Uh -huh. We weren't allowed in the National Press Club until 1971. And a long did, time into the 20th century. When did you start lobbying? A long lobbying? time after suffrage. Yeah. We started lobbying yeah. very, very early. And we were relegated to the balcony finally with all the press, ca the television cameras and we couldn't go ask questions, and, and one of our friends who was assigned to cover a visiting head of state, all the visiting heads of states held their only press conference at the National Press Club. It got to be a tradition. So if you were assigned to cover him at the major event, you couldn't be on the floor, so you couldn't ask questions. If anything happens, you're on the balcony, and you cannot cover it at all. So we were, uh, one of our friends was actually taken off the assignment because she couldn't cover it properly and a, and a male colleague was sent in. So this was the kind of problem that existed. So we protested and uh, went to the State Department and it said that our Women's National Press Club would put on an event open to everyone. We would have a big luncheon if that's what you wanted. And so, no, Nothing helped, so we began sending telegrams to every head of state that was coming here. Uh, we were in Western Union in the middle of the night sending telegrams saying, don't come to this, discriminate, this, this discrimination against women. So our hero was Khrushchev. <laughs> when he came, we had bombarded them with the same propaganda, and he said, I won't go unless women can. So they, had, they finally allowed women, and just for that time, and 1.3 women to every 10 men was the ratio somebody picked it out. For the first time in history, of 1959, women were allowed to sit on the floor <laughs> with their male colleagues who they go toe-to-toe -to -toe on stories with for the first time in history and never to go again until 71. I was at the head table because I was head of the Women's National Press Club, and that's when Khrushchev made his famous We Will Bury You speech. Well, we buried them instead, but uh, I mean, it was a very historic moment. Mm -hmm. So we fought this fight bitterly with, uh, uh, with the State Department, and once I was in an elevator with Dean Rusk, and I was appealing to him to do something about it, because we felt all they had to do was just tell these people, don't go there, go to a place that's open to everyone for your press conference. So I appealed to Dean Rusk at the elevator, and he said to me, well, you should pick it and embarrass them, then maybe that would help. Whereas all he had to do was tell his aides that they should do something and it would have all worked out. So we uh, occasionally, we had our own, we would get people who would say they would come to our open to everyone luncheon. We had these big luncheons. And uh, our, one of our coups, well, we got Madame New, she was supposed to be at the press club on Friday. We got her on Wednesday to a huge 
dinner, with, uh, luncheon with 500 people and scoop the press club on their own. <laughs> so it was battles like that that you had to go through to just try to open it up. How did they justify keeping it closed? They didn't have to. They had total power and control. I mean, discrimination against women was so blatant, but nothing compared to the blacks. At the same time, the civil rights movement and so forth. I mean, we, we, we really, we were discriminated against, but nothing as some of the, the racial problem. But, so yeah, but one of our worst things was that when uh, uh, Martin Luther King came to town, uh, they had their, their only press conference explaining what was going to happen at the National Press Club. Except no the, women. Except for the so, so, Yeah. And so we, we uh, appealed to them to not do that, but they wouldn't have anything to do with it. So we sent out a press release saying, uh, balcony is back of the bus, which got a lot of headlines and caused them considerable embarrassment, but we could never understand why that had happened. And you see, that press club was so prestigious that everyone thought that was the place they had to go or they couldn't have a press conference where everybody would come. That was a basic problem. And the main thing is that when you have this kind of discrimination and you're able to erase it, the next day people wonder, what was all the shouting about? Why? Uh, why did we, you know, hold out for so long? Same thing happened in the Gridiron Club, the White House Correspondents, National Press Club. Every door we had to break down separately. In the Gridiron, we picketed and even closed for several years. And then finally we decided that well, we, we can't do this, we're gonna try something else. So we had a counter gridiron big party in, the, in Mount Vernon College and uh, where they were white tie and tails, we were uh, jeans and no tie. <laughs> and we got all the VIPs in town came to our thing. It was like a carnival. We had events, pin the tail on a male chauvinist pig. And, <laughs> and Dan Rather did a dime a dance uh, stuff and uh, we got over 800 people there. We embarrassed them, got a lot of publicity. We did it two years in a row and they capitulated. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yeah. So by the 1970s, it took until that time. Later like, than the yeah. 1970s. It's yeah. way in the middle. Yeah, we won it. Yeah. 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 Um, in looking at the, um, at, at the White House itself and the change in the number of people who come as, uh, as reporters, um, what has been what has been gained and what has been lost by the changes in coverage? There are now more people. Um, you have more things that are on the record. The president speaks more on the record now than he did, say, at the, when he first came to uh, to the White House. We used to walk around the South Lawn with LBJ. We called them the Baton Death Marches <laughs> because, uh, but we learned more about what a president was going through. By this time, he was in great trauma on the Vietnam War, and trying to figure out how he could work himself out of it, and listening, still listening to the generals. So he would be pouring out his heart, and uh, usually he would say after he had told us so much, it's all off the record. So he <laughs> used to, Helen and I used to be the only ones there around lunchtime, and uh, his press secretary would come in and say, the president wants to talk to you, it's, we'd sit in the cabinet room with the LBJ while I was pouring out his heart about his problems in Vietnam, all off the record. And in those days, we honored off the record, and it was off the record. And one, what, one day, when after he had renounced re-election, and he was feeling really sorry for himself, he gave her a diplomatic reception. <coughs> and Liz Carpenter, the press secretary to the First Lady, had always warned us to try to be ladies and don't carry those big stenographers' notebooks and try to dress nicely. And so, so we carried little notebooks and we were trying to be very well behaved. Johnson came along at the end of the evening, scooped us up, about five or six newspaper women, took us to the family quarters, where passed out a good drink. And, and regaled us with all the stories of the presidency and what he thought of it. We're, I was going to finish my little notebook, grabbing on to notebooks, and, I mean to napkins and match books, and he's <laughs> there writing it all down. He saw us all writing all of this stuff. And when it was, uh, Mrs. Johnson kept coming into the room trying to break it up, 
at the end, again, he handed us each a little chart bracelet and said, now you know it's all off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> but we really got to know Johnson very well. This was another thing. A, a friend of ours, uh, was had asked, she worked for the Washington Star, and she was trying to get a, an interview with the president. So one Saturday, he calls her up, and they call her up and say, the president will give you your interview, come down to the White House. So she went to the White House, and they were going along, and he, he finally said, are you going to that uh, wedding party? With the, that was Koki Robbins that's getting married. And so she said, yes, she was going. So he said, well, come on along. So they go up there, we were all at that thing, and then finally it's over and he takes her back in the limousine and he's gonna continue this endless press conference. So finally she said, Mr. President, no, it's my daughter's 14th birthday and I'm planning a party and I really have to get home. So he whips out a piece of paper, what's her name? He writes a note to her, sorry I kept your mother so long. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped the motorcade, gets her another limousine and sends her home in the limousine with this note for her daughter. <laughs> the AP man and I got into his limousine when he beckoned to us after he had said he wasn't going to run again, but Bobby announced that he was going to run. And so, of course, the AP man and myself kept saying, well, what do you think about Bobby Kennedy deciding to run? He said, do you like these cufflinks? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we ought to tell you a little bit about the difference of what, how we worked our way into covering the White House full time. When we first went to cover the White House, we were covering the uh, east side, the first lady, and we would have to go to these uh, formal parties uh, for visiting heads of state, all dressed in long gowns and uh, gloves up to here. And uh, uh, the men didn't want to cover those, those events because that was just beneath them, social parties, you know. So we went to cover these events. And we pretty soon figured out that here were all the top officials of the government, and we could get to them and ask them a question. So we began doing that, and we would, whatever the big topic of the day was, we could get to the Secretary of State, sometimes the President himself, and we would get these <laughs> wonderful scoop stories out of these parties. So then they decided maybe they ought to come to the parties. <laughs> Actually, you could. You had total access on a social occasion. You let us roam around, mix and mingle. Very good. When did that stop? When did that stop? It stopped really with uh, um, these people. This, this is, I think, we had much more access. Uh, well, no, it stopped really. Hillary hated us to be around. <laughs> <laughs> Something about these women. <laughs> How about the newspaper? <laughs> how, how did it feel to uh, to be, be regarded by a first lady? Yeah, to be I've regarded been, in the hospital? I've been shunned by presidents, so what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I tell you, I mean, they have a right to not suffer us gladly, but we have a right to be there. It's our house. Every president I've ever known has said, this house belongs to you to the American people. I said, oh, great. So when they start pushing me around, I say, hey, I thought this house belonged to me. <laughs> the American people, we pay the taxes. And I always remind the press secretaries that they are public servants. If the president wants a public relations person, he should pay out of his own pocket. But these people are public servants, and they owe the American people the real truth and the information and they're so secretive now, and they're so on, so robotic, and so on spin. Mm -hmm. it's, it's changed a lot. Most of the uh, public affairs jobs in the government started with Roosevelt when they had all these uh, alphabetical new places and nobody knew what they were about. So they hired mostly news people to, and their role was to help the press get with the government and find out what these agencies were about and find their way into the agencies. And uh, they were paid to do that as a public information job. So what's happened as things have gone along is now these people are paid with government money to uh, spin things and to try to keep you away from the uh, public officials. 
and it's been a whole turnaround. Its, it's original purpose was to provide information, and they're paid to help the, the... We pay them. The taxpayer pays them. They're dealing with public information, and they've been dealing with people's right to know, and they have to be schizophrenic. They have to wear two hats. But this press secretary says that he's an advocate for the president. And I don't think that's, I mean, that's absolutely a change of view of what a press secretary should be at the White House. Do you think that, um, uh, that with all of the uh, organization there is at the White House directing, um, uh, directing coverage in a particular way, and putting out an agenda for the day, does that re prevent reporters from covering what is the story? Well, a lot of times that they send out word to the various people, staffs and so on, don't take any calls from the press. Pass it on to the press secretary or the public affairs person. So you used to be able to call up the, the national security advisor or other staff members to find out what was going on. Well, now they want to block this all off. The most closed White House that I've ever covered. Um, uh, in, your, in your book, uh, this is in Dateline White House, and you say, um, uh, on my epitaph, I, I want only one word, why? In the press, that question is central to our search for truth. And not enough people are asking why today. We have no follow-ups, we have no understanding. They will issue their edicts and their pronouncements, and nobody says why. Mm -hmm. That's the, that is the question, if you want any pursuit of, of the real answers. I still don't know why Bush went into uh, Iraq. Well, you've had, um, uh, you've questioned him on the point, and, uh, and, uh, and Scott McClellan and Ari Fleischer, um, you've questioned them as well. Uh, but I got no answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Marlon Fitzwater, when he was asked how, um, uh, how President George H.W. Bush decided when to have a press conference, he said, well, you know, he said, there's a certain pressure that builds up in the press room. He said, the president would ask me uh, about the pressure out there, and, uh, and he would say, what's Helen saying? <laughs> He'd say, let's have one. Uh, Marlon Helen Fitzwater is uh, once made a speech saying, the press, they only know 90, they only know 5% of what goes on around here. And I used to repeat that in speeches. I would say, see? They only tell us 5%. It's a closed corporation here. So he came to me and he said, but you didn't repeat what the rest of, us, of the sentence was, that the other 95% isn't worth knowing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not true. You really, um, there's more secrecy in this administration than I have ever encountered. One of the things that's uh, different is that the president has given fewer solo press conferences than uh, than was once. You're the expert on that. <laughs> was once the case. What what do you uh, what do you all see as the importance of press conferences? What do you get out of a press conference, a, a solo press conference where the president's going to be questioned, say, by about twenty? They, usually, it's about twenty different reporters, and over a period of uh, say about forty five. This is my minutes. lecture. <laughs> a presidential press conference is the only forum in our society where a president can be questioned on a regular basis and held accountable. We are the only transmission belt where he has to really, and it isn't in the Constitution, but it is indispensable in a democracy that a leader should be questioned. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we could have a king, a dictator, he could rule by edict. And, and a great deal is shown by the way the president answers the question. I mean, he may turn it aside, he may not even answer it, but then the public can see what exactly he is doing, and that, that's very revealing, and it's one of the good things about press conferences. He doesn't have to go to Congress, and he could be subpoenaed, but they're not going to do that. But we are after them every day to try to get the answers and to, to explain. You cannot have a democracy without an informed people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our mission, is to try to keep people as informed as possible. But when they have total control of the information and uh, dribble it out, and then not uh, that it, some of it's not quite credible, mm -hmm. we're in trouble. 
What, um, in the various presses that you've covered and have gone to press conferences, what are some of the things that, uh, that you think have come out about them through press conferences? What did you learn about the president through press conferences? Wow, a lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to pinpoint, I think. You, you know, I think everything they say is informative and gives you an a, a idea of what they're thinking and how they uh, comport themselves, mm -hmm. of whether a president can answer a question easily, whether he knows a lot about the subject matter, uh, whether he appears to be in charge of things. I mean, it's, it's uh, totally revealing, I think. And as far as news, there's a lot of news comes out of it, too. But uh, I think you get a, a real feeling about how the president can handle himself. Mm -hmm. I think it uh, takes a lot of courage when uh, there's a crisis, and especially if it's a personal crisis. Jimmy Carter had to answer questions about his brother that were very, very embarrassing, but he still went to the mat with us. And uh, in the case of Clinton, we didn't hold back on Monica Lewinsky questions, and I, I don't know how he was able to really stand up to that. But you can always tell, in the case of Kennedy, his con press conferences were a joy, and they really evoked uh, this tremendous interest in the country in presidential news conferences because he was so warm and witty and uh, could put us in our place, but it was always in good, good with good nature. Mm -hmm. um, LBJ hated news conferences. Uh -huh. I mean, he... The four ones, yeah. He, yeah. Was, he loved experiment us uh, yes. walking around the backyard Salmon. 17 laps. <laughs> and, uh, very one. Status. Peter Lissabon was taking, taking notes and running around. He actually ran into a lamppost and knocked himself out. He had to go to the hospital. <laughs> he would speak in, in a whisper, so we'd all go back to press room. What did he say? What did he say? <laughs> um, you all worked uh, uh, as competitors uh, from the competing wire services. Uh, in what way do reporters um, compete with one another? but uh, also they uh, depend on one another. They help one another in certain kinds of uh, well, circumstances. Well, you're standing in the snow for eight hours waiting for some VIP to come out the door. You're all in it together. I mean, it is a real sharing. If you want to go to the ladies' room or anything else, you share. If you have an exclusive, you don't share. So well, one of the interesting things that reporters nowadays don't have to worry about, and that is a telephone. I mean, the biggest thing was to try to get a phone to get out the story where you were on the road or wherever you were. Now everybody's got a cell phone. It's perfectly wonderful. But we used to fight for phones. <laughs> That's one of the biggest things. And have uh, quarters in our shoe. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and when they were a quarter. Dime, I remember. <laughs> Dime. Yeah. Um, well, let's go to some questions. Um, uh, Let's start with uh, with Towson. I think we'll go back and forth. We'll have a question from Towson, and then we'll have a question uh, here. And we've had a little trouble with the volume there, so um, I'll repeat the questions. Um, yeah, this question is for Ms. Thomas. Um, I read the transcript of a speech you recently gave to um, some students at MIT about the George Bush patch <coughs> Well, you said said it was a speech that she gave at MIT right. about um, about Bush. Yeah. And uh, what would you like to her to elaborate on her, her general views? Well, I forget it. And you know, what what do you think that students could do that would be beneficial to the country um, as, as far as participating? Oh, um, but get out, but both things. <laughs> Participate I, in the election. That's right. I think that when Dean really rallied a lot of the young people, that was a very good to me. Remember that era, too, in the 60s when mm -hmm. people were revved up on a cause. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, this is your generation the 21st century and you are the leaders if you let it go and, and we start in with perpetual war that's what you've got to stop this this syndrome that 
one war after another. Is that the way you're going to repeat? In the 20th century, we had two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf War. That's, that's no way to live. Um, on the Bush administration, um, he said um, a little while ago that uh, he thought it was the most closed administration. Can you, um, can you say uh, uh, how that is so? How does it differ from earlier administrations? The press secretary comes out with one page, and no matter what you ask, he never is on, on uh, the uh, on the word, actually. I mean, you, no matter what you ask, he, he just gives you the same answer. Like, it's been trained, very robotic, and so forth. That, that's not the way to deal with us. Do you think that occurred in, say, in earlier administrations, like the, um, uh, say, in the Reagan administration and the Nixon administration? They pretty much had a, um, uh, an operation <laughs> where... Uh, well, they decided that they would have him on TV say every night was one story. Uh -huh. And they wouldn't let, let us cover a lot of things that we knew that were newsworthy because it would be, would be off the story. So they can control the news in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, how does one go about getting um, the other story, the story that, um, the, the stories they may not want you to cover? You have to have people inside mad at each other. <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's the whole of the war. It happens if you get people to. If like they it. cut it off where they, they send everybody through the press secretary when you try to get a call through, then it is very difficult indeed. Uh, though the problem is to get to people outside of the White House or outside of the telephone uh -huh. uh, because they cut off that way. Thank yeah. God for whistleblowers. <laughs> Thank God for leaks. <laughs> There's no such thing as a leak. There's only inf information they don't want you to have. Uh -huh. um, William Price, who was uh, thought of as the uh, first White House correspondent, although they thought that there were uh, two or three of them in uh, the 1890s, he was, um, in 1902, he was writing about the White House as a beat. And he said, news is rarely distributed at the White House. He said, you usually have to go to other parts of government. They will give you part of the story, but they will only give you their part. And that's still true. And that you have to go elsewhere. And he talked about the need to go up to the hill and then also to go to agencies. And so in some ways, that um, that remains. Well, we're all mea culpa on Watergate. That's true. I mean, but at the same time, we're so circumscribed in what we can cover. And the doors are closed and so forth. So it should take a police reporter, a couple mm -hmm. of them, to really get dig to the facts and so forth. But wire services, we were on the body watch. Our main thing was to see if somebody was still alive when they're out in public, meaning mm -hmm. the President of the United States. States. Mm -hmm. It is true that the, the Hill is one of the best places for information because you have both sides, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, mm -hmm. and there's always some way, some staffer, some uh, a person who really wants to help to get information out, and that is one of the best sources. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can play that back and forth, but uh, that is really a good place to cover. Uh -huh. And um, in the turf wars in the White House, did, um, did they have them in this administration? If they do, I don't think so. I think everyone's on the same page. I think that they, you have no devil's advocates, at least in the Vietnam War and Johnson era, you had George Ball, who was saying, no, no, you know, let's cut mm -hmm. this off, stop this war. But in this administration, I don't think any dissent is tolerated. Um, but you have it between departments. You, there, there are times when you can get something out of a department. There's some differences between them, like between state and defense. Um, but the White House is pretty, pretty buttoned up. Well, I think the State Department and Pentagon, if you really got into the in between them, you would have some. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, the very fact that the Pentagon set up its own intelligence mm -hmm. unit with raw material going in and uh, being able to uh, twist the facts. I mean, there were no caveats, apparently, enough to, well, this whole fiasco of uh, weapons of mass destruction, where are the people? Well, the questions were asked. I mean, you asked the question. Um, uh, 
uh, consistently from uh, from it the didn't start. Matter. Uh, but uh, answers were answers definitely were uh, difficult to get. Let's uh, have a question. Uh, let's have questions from here. Yeah. And he's going to be using the microphone. Oh, thank you. There it is. Hi, I just have a question for both of you. I'm an aspiring journalist, so it's really great to do the work here. But my question is, have you both seen a change, or rather a shift in journalism since 9-11? And if so, what is the shift? Since 9-11? That it's a shift, shift in, in journalism, journalism since 9-11. Was that in the terms, do you think, of the relationship with government? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That there's a different relationship between uh, between Yeah, we, we all rolled over government. and played dead. <laughs> Everybody uh, was afraid to rock any boats, uh, afraid of being called unpatriotic, un-American. And I think that we look very, very bad. We should have been asking the important questions, no matter what. But uh, the whole idea of these televised briefings and fear that uh, people would say, why is she jeopardizing our position here? Why is she jeopardizing the troops and so forth? So I think everyone pulled in their horns after 9-11 for too long. I think it's changing now, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's have a question from Towson. So my question is, with this closing of the White House, can it maybe gradually, possibly following the technological development and the fact that the general population is more interested in what happens in White House with greater internet access to see um, so on, or did it happen specifically with this administration? Um, she was asking about the closing of the White House and whether that it happened gradually. Um, and uh, if it has anything to do with technology, the technology that exists. Closing and what? The, of the White House that, that Helen was saying, and, and, and you too, that, it's, that you don't get to see the president as you, uh, as you once did. Um, what are the factors that have, um, have brought that about? Well, uh, the assassination attempts gradually, the assassination security attempt. has mm -hmm. tightened up. But 9-11 gave them a, a carte blanche to do anything. Uh -huh. But are, are they referring to the tightening up on the news and uh, uh, access? Uh, uh, yes, T uh, uh, and access to uh, access to officials, but also the proactive things too that a White House does. That you have an organization, a whole or a operation like the whole communications operation that comes in under Nixon that did not exist before. Yeah. I mean, before that, you had a press office that responded to your inquiries, and that was the whole communications operation. But after the Nixon administration, the Office of Communications really does a lot of planning. I think a lot, a lot of difficulties started with the Nixon administration because of Watergate, and that caused a whole tightening up of information. Uh, and I think a lot of it, and the antagonism between press and the officials uh, was made were, became obvious then, and I and I think it's that was the beginning of the difficulties, and then it's been carried over not for anything of the same reasons, but because there's more intent to close things down. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1959, uh, the U2 incident occurred, and it and uh, it, it looking at the post World War II period and the whole the the. Uh, I mean, some of the antagonism between the White House and the press. That seems to stand out as one of the first times where uh, the White House is uh, giving a story that is not the truth um, about how, why that plane, what the plane was that was shot down um, in the so over the Soviet Union. They said it was a weather plane and it was a spy plane. And reporters, and going back to the briefings, reporters uh, were very hard on Haggerty about that, about the line. And it, it seems it kind of goes from there to Vietnam to uh, to Watergate. Yeah, Watergate was a real. Person. Once you lose your credibility, you have finished. Really, mm -hmm. I saw two presidents go down the drain: Johnson on Vietnam and Nixon on the Watergate scandal because they had lost their credibility. If the people no longer believe in you, you cannot govern. You cannot convince, and you cannot persuade. You're finished, really. 
I think uh, this president is on a slippery slope because of the weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. that oh. don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> he says they're still looking. There <laughs> uh, was a question over here. That was actually <coughs> question. Oh, okay. In the back. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this question is for Ms. Boone and Ms. Lewin and Ms. Thomas and a follow-up for Ms. Thomas. And uh, that is, Ms. Thomas, in your book, Trump on the White House, you said Mike McCurry was the gold standard of press secretaries. Um, who is the opposite? Who, who do you two like the least? And, um, or, <laughs> and then maybe she can talk about why she thought McCurry was good and why <laughs> why the opposite is the opposite. Yeah. And Mrs. Thomas, how did you be the how did you become the um, the fully research person who closed the White House? Um, and we can't hear him. And yeah, he wants to know um, about the Curry first that you had said in front row in the White House that he was the gold standard for press secretaries, and why? And uh, then how was it that you um, uh, <coughs> closed the press conference? And, um, and so you can. Well, I think that McCurry saved himself and has saved his credibility, which is the most important thing you've got to have, I think, in this life plus being a spokesperson, the impossible job. It is an impossible job. As press secretary at the White House, you speak for the President of the United States. You speak for the United States. You speak for the whole federal government, and you speak for the American people. That's one hat. The other hat is that you have to speak to the press, and therefore to the, to the people. And uh, it's, uh, almost an impossible job, but McCurry did it very well because they think he, he prized his credibility. Wire services used to cover, we manned the barricades long before the advent of TV. And the whole process of press conference was set up in that era when the wires were predominant. And uh, as a consequence, the senior wire service reporter uh, would close the, the uh, news conference, and UPI and AP would rotate on the first two questions. So we were very privileged, and we didn't have to scream like banshees to get at, at a news conference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> there were uh, times I, um, I was in reading Roosevelt's press conferences, uh, there were times when he went out to sea, when he was, because as a former um, Navy person, he was always very interested in ships, and he would go out for some time, whether it was fishing or out on the destroyer, and he would take the free press associations at that time. Um, so Merriman Smith went, uh, Doug Cornell, and uh, Robert Nixon, and so there was a tradition of, um, uh, of the wire services having very a tight little very island prominent island those days. Yeah. I always wonder this major story, I think it was Cleveland who had a, a major operation out on a ship at sea and no one knew about it at all. Yeah. But in those days even they knew how to control it. That's right, but it, it was his uh, secretary, uh, who had been his secretary, Dan Lalonde, who uh, was the one who, who figured out how to do that without, the, uh, without publicity. Well, I think that people have the right to know almost everything that goes on in government. And uh, most candidates, presidential candidates, will promise an open administration on the campaign trail. We used to try to pin them down, how many press conferences will you have, how often, and so forth. The moment they come into the White House, the Iron Curtain comes down. And all information that I think belongs in the public domain <laughs> becomes their private preserve. Mm -hmm. How is that? <laughs> it's really quite Why interesting that? to watch the election campaign now where everything is open and you, they post to every candidate anything, you can ask anything anywhere, and it's just very interesting to see what happens afterward and try to hold it up to them. They always... Uh, <laughs> uh, Carrie, I think, has said he would have one. Everything becomes one top one. secret. Mm -hmm. They want to put in their thumb and pull out a plum every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, take a question from Towson. Um, Helen, you had said that there are no, um, this information that they want us to tell. You said that you think we should tell everything, but are there certain things you feel that we shouldn't know? What things, that, um, what things shouldn't we know? Do you say that we should know just about everything? Oh, what should we not know? Hiding the missiles or... 
that, the box. press That's has always thing. kept secrets, like when we're going to do an invasion or something, or they take the press along, and the press has not, you know, uh, mentioned any of that. I think there are things like that that definitely press has to uh, Once they lie, they've mm -hmm. lost the people, I think. Is at one time, uh, reporters would have things. Better to say no comment than uh -huh. to lie. That seems to be a hard thing for people to say, or yeah. I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> what I interrupted you. I'm okay, sorry. that's fine. <laughs> Let's have a question from here. So just actually a follow-up to that one. In terms of what the public should know as well, do you think everything that we found out about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, do you think that that was our right to know, or do you think that kind of got in the way of maybe what was more um, related to the government business? Monica, Monica Lewinsky. Um, it, was that too much information? <laughs> no, it involves the President of the United States. I, I think that uh, it was a, it's a very sad story, and I think that President Clinton did not know one second, I didn't say minute, in the White House when he was not demonized by the ultra-right. They never gave him any legitimacy. How he stood it for eight years, I will never know. They never let up. They had had the White House, the Republicans, for 12 years, and they were not going to accept. For a senator to say that the President of the United States should not come to my state without a bodyguard, on it went. They said he was not my president and so forth. So how he wrote out those storms, I think he made a terrible mistake was not street smart. I mean, know your enemy. And he should have known that he was being watched and that they would wait for anything. So I'm sure he has many regrets not to have been more aware. But I, it was a legitimate story, no question. At, at one time, we, did, we didn't know much or ask much about a president's health. Uh, so that, uh, say, Franklin Roosevelt had frequent press conferences, but uh, people did not ask him about his health. And at, at one particular point, he went away for a month uh, because he'd been so ill. And uh, it was the three, it was the three same guys, <laughs> Cornell uh, Smith and uh, Nixon, were in uh, oh, yeah, South there, Carolina. There was, a, it was, there was a gentleman's agreement. Mm -hmm. yeah, for example, they never showed him in his wheelchair, which would never happen today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was... Photographers would never take... And, and Kennedy, the same thing. There's a, a lot of information we didn't know about his health. So do you think that we are better off um, with more information rather than less Absolutely. about I do. personal lives? Yep. I mean, we have to I make decisions. If I should run out about candidates going into the White House, too, I think that much more attention should be paid to all these things, like their medical, uh, mm -hmm. any information about them is needed, because after all, they're going to run the country, and if they're not capable of physically of doing it, we have to know that. Mm -hmm. I say that if you want to run for public office, you should decide at the age of five <laughs> <laughs> and live accordingly. <laughs> that's, my, that's the best advice I could give to anyone. If you become a public servant and a politician, you have to know your life will be an open book. From now on, it's no holds barred. Mainstream press might decide, no, 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 we're not going to deal with that. That's personal, private, and what, so what? Tabloids won't let it go, and then we'll be accused of covering up, not dealing with the story. Mm -hmm. Even though we think it's unfair or trivial, you still have to hop on. Mm -hmm. uh, Towson? What do you think, um, looking, say, 40 years from now, the way we're heading right now, what will democracy look like as a result of this more restricted atmosphere? Uh, he was asking, say, to take four years hence, what will the uh, shape of democracy be um, uh, as a result of the restrictions of information? Do you think that it has an impact on our system? I think if there's a continuation of the Patriot Act and they even expand it, I think we're going to lose a whole Bill of Rights. Do you think... Um, uh, do you think that there is a, um, a movement um, against it? That there, um, there are areas where people have uh, uh, 
have been very opposed to it, segments of the society, and it takes some time for them to coalesce. But I like this, like I was thinking oh, of definitely. librarians. I think librarians that people so. are waking up. Mm -hmm. uh, did you hear the applause when the president said <laughs> the Patriot <laughs> Act will expire? <laughs> and that's what? Everybody's all of a sudden, it's, but I am going to ask for. Uh -huh. So I think. I think people are understanding. They don't want that intrusion in their private life. Uh, I Breaking think into the email, checking. Yeah, watch out for uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act too, which is under fire. And I think that's a very important thing because we can't get inside government. And it takes sometimes when press has to file suits to get this, it takes a very, very long time and that was set up so that you could get the information if they had a legitimate reason right away. And I think that's another thing that has to be uh, watched out for. First thing after 9-11, Ashcroft sent a, a memo to all the federal agencies, turn down every FOI request. Mm -hmm. they would, he said that they, the Justice Department would uh, support them in, uh, yeah, in, turning, in, in turning them down. The, the Freedom, uh, Freedom of the Information Act is certainly one of the, uh, the uh, major pieces of legislation that, that, uh, that uh, deals with reporting, with how you do your jobs from the time that, uh, that you all first came to, uh, to Washington. What, what has the impact been? Have you seen that, that really the difference that that act made once it was passed Very, in 1964? So. Yes. Because what it was supposed to do is to, to instead of the government um, uh, having to be, we having to justify why we would the information from the government with the Freedom of Information Act, the government had to justify why they were keeping information from us. What kinds of stories did, during your uh, careers have come out because of the Freedom of Information Act? I think there were a lot of them. I can't uh, uh -huh. pinpoint them, but I know Washington Post had very many cases where they went into things as uh, Associated Press did. They still are doing this mm -hmm. every day. But it's much getting harder and harder. But I, I there's no doubt about though. it that there were a lot of information came out in the Watergate too, uh, through freedom of information. Uh, yeah. Iran Contra. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I do think that uh, they make it so difficult, and they did that. They black out so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're in control of the information, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I take a question from here. Yeah, great question. Hi. Um, I have two questions. The first one is addressed to both of you. Um, out of all the presidents you've covered, uh, who is your favorite and your least favorite and why? And my second question is addressed to Thomas. And I was wondering if you were honored, humbled, or angry regarding Saturday Night Live's impersonation of those people. <laughs> <laughs> like most covering and the presidents you like least covering and uh, and then uh, your response to Saturday Night Live's impersonation of you. <laughs> um, I like covering all presidents. They all hate me and it's mutual. <laughs> now, uh, it was uh, very inspiring to cover JFK because I really felt that he had his eyes on the stars he told young people like you to go into public service to give something back to the country. It was a sense of uplift that you got with mm -hmm. Kennedy. I mean, it wasn't all perfect and he hated us, but nevertheless, we saw where he was going. Uh, LBJ was a three ring circus. I mean, you never knew what the man was going to do next. He was totally paranoid and <laughs> they wouldn't even tell his wife where it was going. I went to Texas twice without a Right. We were in an airplane once when they didn't know where the airplane was going. <laughs> they changed their mind in the midst of the air. This is the last part of it. Oh, oh on the uh, Saturday Night Live. Well, I think I could have done a better job. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done Saturday Night Live? Huh? Have you ever uh, no. been a guest at Saturday Night Live? Yeah. In fact, I never watch it, but I've always told them about it. <laughs> Fran, who are your uh, favorite? Well, I have to uh, I have to go along with that. I thought Kennedy was uh, a lot of fun to cover and was very interesting. 
And, but I, always, I also liked Johnson because I thought we had so much more access to him. I mean, you really knew him once and all, as it were, because we, we chased him over the uh, uh, Texas hill country, yeah, yeah. Hill country and, and uh, you know, and he'd pick us up and take us in his limousine to ride somewhere. You could talk to him. I mean, and these things he did with us in the cabinet room. I mean, you really had an insight into what the president was going through and what he was like. I mean, he didn't always like what he did, but he certainly, he was accessible. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, he was more accessible in some ways than and Kennedy was. And I was totally was. interested in the news. He had three um, kickers mm -hmm. in, in, office. in the Oval Office. Uh -huh. You know, there's a picture of him where he is looking at the, um, at the, at the, at the wire copy, but he has, he has it. He's gone down on his knees, and he's, he's watching it when it's being typed out. Coming up, yeah. <laughs> the wonderful story about her colleague, uh, uh, Spivak, who was in his telephone booth uh, phoning in a lead to something that just happened, and the press secretary came out and knocked on the door and said, President says you've got the wrong lead. <laughs> <laughs> we always felt we were wired, you know, that he had heard everything. In fact, they used to write our names after questions. Uh -huh. Oh, I know who asked that question. <laughs> the president was, he wanted to know who was asking yeah. all the media. He would questions. listen in to uh, the, the uh, little press briefing in the office with Reedy and uh, when we were all around, and he would be listening <laughs> in, and he would call him on the phone and tell him to do something. And we would see his face would go white because uh -huh. he told us was calling. <laughs> <laughs> President of the United States. Um, I think we're at Montalcin. Montalcin next. Okay. Um, you both seem to have a very cordial relationship with President Kennedy. So, with how is it like to have a Kennedy's assassination? Um, you all both of you had a cordial relationship with Kennedy. What was it like to cover his assassination? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, a close relationship is, is not exactly the <laughs> We had a repertorial <laughs> adversarial. Um, well, my boss, we had one man in Dallas. Mm -hmm. He was a brilliant reporter, the best that could ever come down the pike. He had covered the White House from FDR on. His name was Merriman Smith. He had been a gun buff. He knew the difference between a backfire and a gunshot. Uh, in those days, the motorcades were like five cars, mm -hmm. and the wires were in the third car, mm -hmm. the UPI and the AP. The third car in the motorcade in Dallas. And Merriman Smith always knew, no matter what the weather, to keep the window down, to hear what's going on. He heard the three shots, and he picked up the one phone. If, in those days, there were not cell phones. They had none, and so forth. But one phone, he always knew enough to sit in the front seat where the, front, where the phone was. He grabbed the phone called in a bulletin to Dallas that three shots had been fired at the president's limousine or the motorcade. And uh, then from then on, he kept holding on to the phone and kept, he was a real talker. He could you know, talk to embroider any story, although he didn't quite know what was going on as they were zooming toward Parkland Hospital. And the AP man was beating on him. The AP man, it phone. turns out, was a guy who covered Congress and he was sent because it was a political campaign and he really didn't know how this wire service stuff worked. So Merriman Smith held on to that phone forever. <laughs> <laughs> Until they got to the hospital. And then he jumped out, and as he was running toward the, the hospital door, he saw Clint Hill, who was the first lady, Jackie's uh, chief uh, secret service agent, pounding on the limousine saying he's dead. So he called that in as a bulletin, of course, and we put it on the wire, but it was not official uh -huh. at that time. And each year, reporters who were in the motorcade ran and grabbed phones from nurses and so uh -huh. forth, started dictating everything they could. And the, uh, the, his, the, assess the death of, of Kennedy was not announced for about an hour or two later. But Smitty knew that you always move with you move with the whole mm -hmm. entourage. You, even if you're in the middle of your story, you drop the phone and go with them. And of course, he left with them, and he saw the 
got on to Air Force One and watched the swearing in and everything. So and AP's fiasco was he won the Pulitzer Prize on that. Mm -hmm. This new man who had not covered so much was in the phone booth dictating, and when the travel uh, guy from the White House, Ray Zook, came by knocking on everybody's window and saying the president's going back. He didn't know who this guy was knocking on his window, uh -huh. so he kept dictating and he missed the plane back. Oh, so God. we were in very deep trouble for the coverage <laughs> of the assassination. You know where Helen and I were? <laughs> <laughs> Helen and I were having taking to lunch one of Mrs. Kennedy's staffers in uh, Paul Young's restaurant in downtown Washington. And somebody had a radio next door, you know, in the place, and all of a sudden we heard this. So the two of us jumped up. I said, well, it isn't Saturday football, it's Friday. <laughs> so I went over and I said, something going on here. The president's been shot. We shot out of that. She went out. to her office, I went to mine, we left this woman with the check. <laughs> 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 to this day, we know her. <laughs> <laughs> and from then on, we covered four days of the funeral, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody slept. You know, you mm -hmm. didn't want to. Mm -hmm. It was very yeah. tough job. Uh, we were there when they brought the body back at three o'clock in the morning. The chief of protocol was waiting for Mrs. Uh, Kennedy when she walked up the steps of North Portico, and he said, "Mrs. Mrs. Kennedy, is there anything I can do for you?" She said, yes, find out how Lincoln was buried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hell, the whole thing. They had a great sense of history. Mm -hmm. Everything was planned, and it was, you know, remarkable. Mm -hmm. Was there um, a difficulty getting information? No. And afterward? During, after the assassination. Not really. Uh -huh. People were very emotional. The mm -hmm. stories were mixed, everything. So people talked more. Mm -hmm. And there was and it was, they really wanted this out. It wasn't something that anybody wanted to keep to themselves. I mean, the whole story of the mm -hmm. funeral arrangements. And we started and covering the, the, what, what's incredible about a democracy was the smooth transition to the next president. And uh, it was almost automatic. And of course, LBJ had been training for that all of his life. Mm -hmm. And so he just took over. And we were camped out and do at uh, LBJ's Spring Valley house. The telephones under the trees, and mm -hmm. uh, so you know he went from one. So he actually house. didn't move yeah. into the White House immediately. Right. Yeah. We have a question here. Um, He's been trying a long time. Okay. <laughs> you. Me. Well, my question is: Is hers the story? Yeah. I wondered if you would put yourself in the in the place of the, of the president. You, uh, and you, you, you made this case that um, there should be as much access and, and we should have as much information as possible. But supposing you were a first term president whose main goal was to be a second term president, what kind of, what instructions would you give to your people in terms of? Whose well, main goal was what? Re-election. Whose well, main goal was re -election. Problem. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> no, but I mean, that is the truth, though. So what, what, what uh, I, I mean, what, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of a public relations and press office should they have in their own interest? I mean, I have the feeling at the moment that they're so secretive that it's boomerang in front of them, and they've made wrong decisions, and they're, they're going to be by them. But should they be as... I don't think they should be his flags, frankly. What do you think they should have? I think, think there ought to be industry. a strong separation between the people's business and his political uh, ambitions. Yeah. But that seems to be the real problem, that the, the first time you get into office, your aim is to get reelected. And so you're always trying to see how it's going to face out for, you know, what's going to play with the public. And I think that you have to separate it and the, the business that you're really conducting, the, the presidential business should be open. I mean, what your personal thing is, I think that you have to worry about that in another agenda. But when you're working on information, on legislation, on activities, I think that should all be open. Don't you think that uh, most presidents, as they've come in, have wanted to stay there? Sure. And, uh, but, and I, but I think that they grown. But the agenda should not be that the that the uh, 
the people's information should be stopped by that and, mm -hmm. and that everything should be spinned mm -hmm. to make you look good. I mean, it's a very difficult situation, but I think that's why we're there to try to push them to get out of that mode. Mm -hmm. And they all fall in this syndrome. They're, they're so beleaguered and the loneliest job in the world. We're trying to get them out of there. <laughs> Towson? <clears throat> uh, question about uh, working the wire services. Could you talk a little bit about the differences between working for the wire services versus the TV uh, networks or the New York Times um, and that sort of thing? He, uh, he, he wanted to know about the difference of working for a wire service and working for a newspaper, such as say uh, the Times. So, Fran? First of all, you have a deadline every minute. I mean, you can't sit around and uh, wait to gather more information. You go into a press conference, you have to come out. In our days, when you didn't have television people, you know, and all this stuff, uh, you would have to hit the phone and that was it. So you don't have time to to work on your story, to uh, check it out, not check it out, but to advance it, and to get more information. You can do that maybe later, but at the instant, you're hitting the phone and running. And that's the biggest uh, right. difference. And at the uh, presidential, at the FDR news conferences, or, or Eisenhower, or any of the long for TV, well, TV, Eisenhower had, te he, he television, had television on a delayed basis. Yep, Kennedy, Kennedy was the first right. television. But before that, the wire service reporters would be calling one bulletin after another, three bulletins. You know, first bulletin story, they would uh -huh. do it, and then the second, then the third, and then they'd go back and wrap up the stories. Uh -huh. But they do that, uh, say, with the, uh, with the Roosevelt press conference afterwards? Yeah. They did they, that? They, but they didn't have any help. Like now, back in the bureau, your own bureau, they're taking it off television and they can yeah. put it on. You don't have to do anything but just sort of watch what's happening and maybe uh -huh. give some color into the story. But they can get it like that. But in our days, we were stuck with And when you're out on the road, you have no help. You just have to run with the story and dictate it. We're always dictating mm -hmm. as fast as we can anything that happens. What's the, what would be an average length of a story? Like say you were doing any um, story on a uh, press conference in the, in the, first, uh, the first bulletin that you would put out, how long would it be? First bulletin is just a paragraph, but uh -huh. they usually, they're about 800 words is the most they, nowadays they have, would allow. It used to go on forever. For example, the unknown soldier, when the tomb of the unknown soldier, when they brought the first unknown soldier back, I mean, AP's story just went on and on and on. He just dictated constantly, and there was no end to the story. But nowadays, papers don't want all that much, and they don't even want to edit it, so they want your story to be maybe 400 words. Mm -hmm. At the moment. Yeah. During, um, uh, in one of the Roosevelt press conferences, um, it was during one of the, uh, they were at sea, and it was during one of the, um, uh, the trips um, abroad that he took uh, to meet uh, with uh, uh, foreign leaders. But he, the president, asked Doug Cornell if it was true that he had, in the, in the previous day, filed 15,000 words. And, uh, and he said that it was. Yeah, because the, the president knew that that was uh, a really some he historic was level. He dictator. He, he could do it just beautifully. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's one of the most difficult things. You have to be able to dictate a story, punctuation, everything, and, and as you go. And then, as you say, there's three bulletins that you're handling. You have to ha have an ad to the first bullet, an ad to the second. You have to keep this all in your head and on your notes. And it's very difficult. And uh, New York Times, they've got all day to work on their story. Mm -hmm. And they can go check in information, try to find background from other people and all that. We had to have it all with us or it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And for the end of the war, Doug, uh, AP, stood over a teletype machine. And by this time, they had dispatches from London, Paris, Berlin, Tokyo, Washington you name it. He had all his dispatches. He stood over the teletype, dictated the bulletin first, and then the editor came over, took one look, and said, let it roll. He started dictating for an hour and a half the end of the war, uh -huh. World War II. Uh -huh. 
question from here? Yesterday we had uh, treated with about an hour press conference with the president and the president. I'm interested in your opinion on only the uh, effectiveness of that uh, press conference, but also the performance of the president and the performance of Tim Russell as a journalist. I'm going to pass on that. I think that. Um, of course, it was not a press conference. It was an one-hour-long interview. I think that uh, Tim Russert did a good job. I expected him to be more Uriah. He go into the, to the Oval Office. You are awed, you know. Uh, he's in charge, and it's very intimidating. Actually, you think uh, you should really bow and scrape a little bit more. But I thought he he was uh, on t on target, and uh, he persisted, which was good. I thought the president looked uh, uncomfortable at times. Uh, certainly, he, would, he knew he was under the gun. He knew he was being tested on very tough questions in terms of the war, economy, uh, his military record, and so forth. I could, you could tell that he had been primed for answers. They obviously uh, could tell what questions he predict what questions that were going to be asked. So he, he certainly survived it, but I don't think, I mean, um, I think it told us a lot. I think it was a very good thing in the sense of you got an idea of what was happening to the president. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, you know, we now have uh, many more ways to see a president. It used to be that, um, that you saw the president in a press conference, and that was it. Say Eisenhower had 193 press conferences. Uh, Bill Clinton had 193 press conferences, but if you add in his short question and answer sessions and his interviews, it comes out to be 1,600. And so we really see a president in a lot of different ways. And uh, interviews seem to be one of the ways now that, uh, that we dig down. He's in. only had 11 in three years, which yeah. is really a long time between drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is, if it's a one-on-one -on -one interview, it's not as good because the, the reporter is also on uh, scene here and, uh, and, uh, and is intimidated in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So that when you're all in a big group and it's not that kind of thing, it's mm -hmm. much better and easier. Mm -hmm. And there's interesting things is when the president has a VIP visitor in, in the Oval Office, they always allow the press to come in. And it used to be that you could ask a question then they, the, the way things happen is, then they said, only cameras can go in, no reporters. So the, the, the television people said, if, uh, if our reporters don't go in, our cameras don't go in. So that at least put some pressure. See, the effort is always, there's always these fights always for every infinitesimal thing. Then there's the question of whether once you're in there, you can ask a question. And you used to be able to ask a question or two. Yeah. Now yes, okay. they don't allow any questions, and if they take a shot, the president says something, and the visiting dignitary smiles and says something, out, lights out. Mm -hmm. um, and so this this is the way it gets, keeps getting cut down. Uh -huh. Reagan had uh, top advisors. He had Jim Baker, Ed Meese, and so forth, who were really the top people, plus Michael Jesus. And, uh, when he first took over, he was very friendly to us at the photo ops. We would uh, throw questions at him, and he was very affable. And uh, his top aides were very would become apoplectic because they thought they were smarter than him, and they didn't like his answers. They taught him to say when we'd go in for a photo op, "This is not a press conference. A business is a photo op." <laughs> Once we went in, I don't know what was happening, it was some crisis, Sam Donaldson and I started throwing questions at the president like, as if it was a press conference. And he said, President Reagan said, I can't answer that. We said, why not? He said, because they won't let me. <laughs> These were his top aides. <laughs> they won't let me. <laughs> we said, but you're the president. <laughs> We have another question from Towson. How would you comment on uh, the 
because many believe that the American press is significantly milder towards the administration than foreign press towards their government. For example, at the beginning of the Iraq war, Tony Blair was treated significantly more harshly by the British press than President Bush by the American press. Um, she's asking about the uh, difference between um, uh, asking questions of the uh, of the president. The, the U.S. press corps seems to be um, uh, lighter on the uh, on the president at the beginning of the Iraq War than was true in other nations, in particular uh, Britain. There, Tony uh, Blair got uh, questioned in, in a very sharp manner. Well, you bet. I mean, Blair has to face. Are we talking about the contrast? Yes. Well, Blair has to face the House of Commons in once a week and go mm -hmm. home very hard. The president doesn't even have to have a news conference. He sure isn't having because reporters aren't putting enough pressure on mm -hmm. to get those answers. I mean, there are so many questions about war mm -hmm. that are not being answered. Do you think um, uh, that the um, U.S. press is more deferential to its leaders than, say, is true in Canada? Um, Britain, well, I think Germany. we were tougher right after Watergate, but I think 9-11 subdued everyone and they went into a real coma. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Graham? Do you think there are uh, differences? I, I think they're tough uh, here as well. I mean, for in certain instances, it's not. But basically, they're asking the questions that need to be asked. Mm -hmm. The trouble is we don't have enough press conferences. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would see it come out more and more if we had more of these press conferences. I, I don't. It's an interesting thing that maybe some other people ought to look into. That is the question of televising these things. I think that uh, being on television, knowing that you're on television, is very restrictive to people. And that perhaps both on the part of the press corps asking the question and the president answering the question, and even in the uh, press uh, briefing, briefing it, it's made a large difference in the kind of information you get because you know it's going out there live everywhere maybe it doesn't go on the air but like i see it every day in my office when the you know i know what's going on everybody can tune in on all the networks and so on and in some way it's 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 uh it's in, in intimidating and i'm not sure that it's the greatest thing that's happened to us being on television i have to tell you that um Yes, and McCurry uh, has talked about that, and um, uh, of course there's no way to revisit that decision once the briefing went on. But uh, they want it. They want the press to look like ogres, mm -hmm. asking it, these mean questions. Well, that, you know, at some time during the press conferences, you know, when everyone was shouting, Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, the public was complaining about how rude and awful the press was to the president. <laughs> And uh, so now we have the system where the president, they put where are the names of who's everybody sitting where, and the president says, uh, calling on whoever they want. Mm -hmm. so yeah, they give him a list of who to call on. He won't call on me. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, they put her in the back row. <laughs> uh, do we have another question here? Our last question in uh, California. Up here, we have a list. I'm wondering, I have a question really as a consumer of news as much as anything, and it seems to me over the last perhaps 10 years or maybe a little bit more, that more and more public figures, not just in the White House, but even congressmen, whoever is on the, on the news, have learned that they can simply ignore the question and say whatever they want. Journalists ask questions, the answers often bear no relation to the question. Is there something that journalists should be doing? Is it something that viewers should be doing to counteract that? Well, I think it is a problem, but the thing is that that's where the follow-up questions should come. I mean, if you are not getting an answer to the question, you should ask again. And I recall asking someone five times and was given the same root answer, and I said, well, I guess you're not going to answer that question. And he said, well, I did. So there is this question of you want to stonewall, you can stonewall. But if anybody's watching, they can see that you're not answering the question. So I think, like in a press conference, it would be totally obvious if the president ducks a question that uh, everyone will see. So in some sense, that is showing the inability of the person you're interviewing. So it reverberates back. But it doesn't help you in getting information, but the only thing you can do is try again. 
But if they don't want to, they're not going to tell you anything. Our recourse uh, in the past has been to write about it, to say there's a blackout on the news here, and we put that much pressure on it, I mean, it's effective. Our editors always say, nobody cares about the problems of the press. Well, I found that's very different because when the Clinton administration came in, George Stephanopoulos was head of communications, and he closed the door of the press secretary that we couldn't go there. And I said, what do we need a press secretary then if we can't go and talk to him? And they locked the door. But they made the mistake of having the briefings on television. And they were hearing me shouting, why? What, how dare you lock these doors? We've been going here since uh, Eisenhower. So for eight years later, I was still asked, can you go to the press secretary's office now? Well, they had to open up one week after we started shouting from coast to coast. Uh, that, that, you have to put right. up, you have to show them that the, you, you're not rolling over. Uh, from the beginning of when we covered the White House, there was always an effort, well, you can't uh, be in the, in the receiving room or you can't do this or that, and we would write these stories and that was the point that our editors always said to us, we don't care what your troubles are. We don't want to write about the press vicissitudes. And we would say, look, this is them cutting us out. And, and every time we wrote about it and paid attention to it, the situation would get cleared up. And it was absolutely true that you have to keep pointing out these little steps that they take to try to separate you from the information. The problem is in these briefings now, if nobody support, none of the reporters support each other enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they should stay on subject, it really helps, uh, and often they don't, they all come, everyone comes in with their pet questions, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that in terms of an Eisenhower press conference where he had them uh, every other week, and so they were a very regular um, item in, um, in 1960. Uh, Sarah McClendon asked a question that she'd asked several weeks running, uh, asking him what decisions Nixon had been involved in. And Eisenhower was irritated and he, and he said, uh, only I make decisions, and that Nixon hadn't been involved in any decisions. Uh, and then Charlie Moore, who was then with Time Magazine, said, understand, he said, working off an earlier question, understanding that only you make decisions. What ideas has um, the vice president been in, involved in? And that's when uh, said, President give Eisenhower. Give me a week. <laughs> yeah, give me a week and I'll, I'll try to think of uh, something, and which was uh, devastating. But that was one reporter working off another. And that's right. definitely going okay. through press conferences. You can Follow certainly up. you can certainly see that change. And, and in part, it probably comes about because they just uh, they don't occur that often. And um, uh, there's, so another, but there's another problem. Organizations send their reporters in to ask a question, and they only get one shot at it. And so they, they're only doing what the boss says to do, mm -hmm. so that it's not that old effort to follow up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a Good evening, this is our second session in the course on uh, White House communications that is uh, a, um, a, I'd say a two-state process, except we're, uh, we're stateless here, uh, Washington, D.C. from uh, to uh, Towson University in uh, Towson, Maryland. And uh, the idea of this course is to give people an idea of what the relationship is between the White House and the press from the viewpoint of those who are part of the relationship. We are going to have uh, White House officials here. Dan Bartlett is going to come and Scott McClellan and Mike Curry will um, uh, will be guests in uh, three different weeks. And uh, then we have a, uh, last week we had William Seal, White House historian, who um, provided the setting for us of, uh, of the White House as a building and the ways in which it had been used to publicize the presidents and, uh, and their programs. Tonight, we have two pioneers. Um, Francis Lewin and Helen Thomas are uh, two reporters who have been important in uh, Washington uh, for, the, uh, for the work they have done 
and also for the uh, path that they blazed uh, for women. Um, I remember, Helen, when I uh, first uh, met you in 1975, when uh, I came into the White House working on portraying the president when uh, Mike and I came in. And, uh, and Helen welcomed every woman who came in as a reporter or me as a scholar and made sure that, um, that we were helped. And uh, because women at that time and way before had not been, and uh, Fran and, and Helen had made sure that they got access to uh, the corridors of power. Well, you did, Helen. <laughs> I mean, look at all the battles the two of you waged. <laughs> we chained ourselves to the White House vets and the jail. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Well, you uh, real, 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 real pioneers. <laughs> well, you certainly did. You took on the uh, Correspondents uh, Association, the uh, National Press Club, the Gridiron. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, good group between, uh, between the two. Cosmos Club. It was going to be the next fight, but they committed to leave. They came first. Huh? Um, it, they worked um, for uh, competing wire services. They've been friends, but uh, worked for competing wire services. Helen worked for United Press International and um, uh, until uh, recently, what year was it? Is it uh, when you went to Hearst? Is it 99? Uh, when you went to Hearst newspapers? 2000. 2000. And um, uh, Fran uh, worked for Associated Press um, and went to uh, CNN in 1981. You were there at the beginning. <laughs> and in the first year. Uh -huh. And uh, she created CNN. <laughs> <laughs> in the good old days. In the good old days. Hard place for women. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a good uh, a good place to to begin is um, uh, is what was reporting from the White House like when uh, when you came to Washington, even though. Um, you, when you started, you were not White House cars. <laughs> Tell them about India. Oh, well. <laughs> the worst part of all of this was that Jackie never said anything. And we traveled all through the Greek islands, and what we did was a travelogue. And we'd listen in. They would report back to what she was doing on the ship to shore radio. So we tuned in to the radio. We got this stuff so we could report it. Well, they found out what we were doing, so then they would go into French, Italian, but we had guys who would spoke these languages and we'd say, hey, Joe, it's French. <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, got in on all this stuff. But it was mostly a travelogue and, and battles, too. She went skiing one, one day off a, a beach and uh, had the Greek Navy chase everybody off the beach. And so our photographers got arrested and we went there to get him out of jail and uh, said to the captain of port, what does your queen do when she wants to go skiing? He says she goes to a private place. <laughs> Jackie was going to ski at this place, hoping everybody just get everybody out of there. So we had a lot of fun with that. India. India. Oh. <laughs> Did both of you go to India? No. Um, I went to India. She went to India and Pakistan. And uh, the whole time, she never said anything. And the biggest thing we got was Jackie made a amnesty to get a crowd. And, uh, <laughs> and so we were, we were, once again, we're writing travelogues, where she is, what she was wearing was the big thing. We, we knew we were gonna have trouble, so we asked the press secretary before we went, could you please tell us who the designers are, what the clothes are like, because we always get the colors wrong and everything wrong, so we would like to be really right on this. So mistakenly, he gave us all this information in advance. So therefore, <laughs> most of what we wrote was about what Jackie was wearing. And they were very upset about that. And I remember a colleague of mine was very impressed because we were going to go to the Khyber Pass, and that was so dramatic. He always wanted to go there. So we went to the Khyber Pass, and the two big stories were, one, Jackie wore wraparound sunglasses, <laughs> which were the newest thing. And the other was one of the uh, cameramen put one foot over the border into Afghanistan, and they were going to grab him and take him away. You were on top of the elephant. Oh, then there was that. He's giving me all these incidents. Jackie was, Jackie was going to come in the India. They, they decorate the elephants magnificently. They paint them with chalk and all this, and they looked wonderful. There was going to be this big parade of elephants in a courtyard for her. So we got there early, and uh, the, some of the 
uh, guy said, would you like to ride on an elephant? So we said, sure. So we got up on the elephants and they're parading around. All of a sudden, Jackie arrives and we're up on the elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get down, how are we gonna cover Jackie? <laughs> so Theo Wilson. Never it. fear, she would say nothing. <laughs> New York Daily News was there. She said, don't worry, Jackie never says anything. So, you know, that was true. <laughs> so we were saved, but there was no, she didn't. Um, What were the rhythms of the day at the White House then? Uh, today, for example, uh, well, let's say not this very day, but uh, uh, on an ordinary day, the press secretary has um, an open meeting in the morning. The gag only has a briefing that's televised in the afternoon say at 12.30 or so, and then there are the other briefings that are coordinated with it from state and defense. And the president is going to appear usually in a speech um, at least once during that day, maybe twice, and a fundraiser at night. What were the, the rhythms at that time of the uh, White House? What did the president do? When you, were, uh, when you were covering him, how many things would you expect the president to be doing during a day? Many things. I mean, I thought that Kennedy era was a golden era. It was a greatly inspired. Uh, we could walk side by side with him. Uh, when he came out, there was no uh, gaggle of, of uh, Secret Service protecting him. We had incredible access. Mm -hmm. And he would make many appearances a day. The news was not that programmed as that one appearance a day, which later on they wanted the president to only show up once a day and so forth. It was very much more freewheeling. Kennedy would come through uh, through the reception room where we'd be hanging out. And, uh, we'd see his visitors to the door. We would throw questions at him. It was very uh, different in the sense of access. And the press secretary had a little office where everybody could walk in or out. There was free access. And he would have a, just a press session with everybody standing around his desk and just shooting questions yeah, at him. There was no television and nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So it was very much more informal and then we had a lot of access Palm Beach usually in the winter time then um, Pierre was ordered not to wear shorts anymore <laughs> <laughs> was that <a> television <laughs> yeah, by that time they got <laughs> we used to travel a lot because he went down to their place at uh, both at Hyannisport in the in the summertime and Florida in the winter time so we had a lot of traveling press operations, which was interesting. And uh, we all moved from one place to the other and just lived there when they were there for their periods of time. Both of you followed um, Mrs. Kennedy. And, um, and tried to. And, and, and reported she, her as she well. Hated yes. us. <laughs> she hated us. She hated us. Well, I, I traveled with her to in, uh, in the Mediterranean where the press a small group of press hired a 54-foot ocean-going yacht to follow this big uh, yacht that she was loaned by one of the Greek magnates there. And we had to follow her through, from island to island. And the very first night out, there was a big electrical storm, and, and our guy said, I'm really sorry, we're going to have to pull into a port. We can't ride this storm out. So he said, oh boy, we're lost. We we're out of this. And so we pulled into this place, and the next morning the sun was shining brightly, and the greatest sight was her yacht parked next to us. <laughs> but uh, what was the atmosphere? Uh, what was the atmosphere in Washington uh, for reporters and their relationships with officials? And uh, what about at the White House? Ellen, why don't you start? Um, you came, when you I came. went to the White House, <coughs> let's say when you came to Washington. When I came to Washington, it was World War II. I had never seen our country more unified. Everyone was in it together, except everyone believed in the war and so forth, and the whole town was rallied in one spirit, and had, they had moved from the Great Depression. So great people had come to this country, to, to this town, from all over the country. Social workers, teachers, healthcare, everyone, all wanting to pitch in and bring the country back, and then we went into World War II. But um, I think we never had any sense of dissent, as we later saw in Vietnam. As for the uh, press, there was a very small group of men, mostly men, but some women who did come to press conferences. And of all things, Franklin D. Roosevelt held two news conferences a week in the Oval Office. 
And of course, he was in total command and couldn't quote him directly. And if he didn't like the question, he'd tell you to go stand in the corner or put a dunce cap on. So it was, you were kind of taking a chance to ask a question that was a little off the uh, parameters. But uh, it was a town that uh, I think all of you would have liked it then. It was not divisive and everyone was pulling together and had a real sense of unity. Uh -huh. And you have to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt, who was responsible really for getting a, a lot of women journalists their first jobs because she held press conferences closed to men and only women could cover her. So every organization had to hire a woman reporter to cover Mrs. Roosevelt. She made news. Yes, she did. And uh, that was a breakthrough for a lot of women who uh, the organizations couldn't cover Mrs. Roosevelt without a woman. So mm -hmm. that, that led the way in a sense to. The whole moose was to get these people to hire women uh -huh. reporting. Uh -huh. uh, what was reporting on the First Lady uh, like? What's that, what sort of subjects? Um, say compare uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and, and Bess Truman and, and Mamie Eisenhower. Well, because I, you all covered, I guess between you two, you covered me. Well, really, I didn't start covering until maybe Eisenhower, but we all knew about Mrs. Roosevelt, and she mm -hmm. traveled all over and took women with her. Bess Furman, who worked for the Associated Press and then for the New York Times, wrote, wrote books about uh, her travels, and she made news everywhere. And so that was a big uh, boost for women in that mm -hmm. uh, direction, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, Bess Truman uh, did not do very much. I mean, she was not, she was, stayed out of that kind of role. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Mrs. Roosevelt was really a controversial person. Of course, she was so dynamic, and uh, she was butting in everywhere to, as a real do-gooder, mm -hmm. and she was slammed all over the place, and there was a cartoon showing her going down the coal mine. And the one mind is saying to the other, here comes Eleanor. <laughs> you can also see her in the crossfire in, at, at, in bat on battlefields and so uh -huh. forth. She walked in where angels feared the dead. <laughs> um, oh, she also took a look where you live now, at Georgetown. Uh -huh. And it was all black by that time. And she said, isn't this lovely? Isn't it quaint? And the white started moving in and buying up the property. She transformed it, uh, uh, maybe for the better, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. I always um, was had a, a later incident with her. I was trying to get copies of, uh, see if there were any transcripts of the press conferences that she had to get an idea of what was going on, and nobody seemed to have them anywhere. So one day I ran into Mrs. Roosevelt and I said to her. Do you know, does anybody have any transcripts of your press conference? And she said, now who would want that? <laughs> My day. <Yeah. laughs> no, it was a different atmosphere. But of course, I mean, the whole question of journalism, press corps, and so forth has just grown mm -hmm. monumentally. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the first time you walked into the uh, West Wing of the White House, into the press room there? And what was it like? We saw last it was, time. Uh, kind of on it inauguration was. day, January 20, 1961. I moved in with Kennedy and I never left. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was one room, what it now would be the National Security Affairs Office. It was, I, I don't yeah. know what happened. You, when, when, when you go in the, uh, the West Wing, right. uh, the, the, the newspapers the all around. Right to the right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You have to say something else. It was very different because when you walked in, there was an entrance lobby with a huge table that had come from some former president and a couple of couches around. That was the entrance to the president's oh, yeah. office. So guests came right past there, and press could sit out in a, on a couch and watch who's coming in and out of the president's mm -hmm. office. Then to the side, we had our press room, mm -hmm. which was maybe half this size, mm -hmm. just about that big. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a it little looked like a men's club with leather furniture, and spittoons, and <laughs> <laughs> places to sleep. And, and we had a little telephone. Up. We had actual telephone booths to where we went in to uh, okay. phone in our stories. Were the phone booths in the press room itself? Yeah. How many people would um, would be there on a, on a normal day? How many people would be uh, sitting around the couches and following the? Um, 
president back then. Well, it depends on when the briefing, maybe I would say 15 or mm -hmm. 20. Mm -hmm. Not a lot. So, and how many women? Us. <laughs> 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 full time. We were there all the time. We were the gold dust twins. <laughs> um, women would come for the briefings and so forth, but we were the wires and we stayed there eight days a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Um